Are you feeling fine this morning? Are you feeling as fine as Mike is this morning? I hope so. Uh, Mike did that last, uh, last week for our men's conference and opened up with that. And I said, we need that on Sunday morning to get everybody woke up. Uh, glad to have you this morning. If you're visiting, just know that we love to have you here with us this morning. Uh, come back and be with us. Give you a few announcements this morning. Number one. Uh, after the service this morning, we are having a uh, meal fundraiser for our uh, decora Christmas decorations. It's in the social hall. It's $15 a plate. It is pork loin, and let me tell you, even if I did cook it, it is amazing. Uh, I, did, I did sample it this morning, so it's good. Uh, so we're having pork loin, green beans, uh, corn, sweet potato crunch, uh, Gina wouldn't let me taste that, but I'm, I assure you that's good, rolls, and then we'll have a cake auction, and there's some pretty good-looking cakes down there, so uh, and all this money will go uh, for our Christmas, de Christmas decoration since we um, renovated. We don't have a place to put our big Christmas tree, so we're going to have to purchase some new Christmas trees and all that good stuff, so um, that will be immediately following the service. Uh, next Sunday morning, we will have Deacon Ordination. Uh, you know, we elected James Campbell and Josh Durham uh, as our new deacons to go on, and we need to ordain Josh, so we're going to do that next Sunday. Uh, so be in prayer for them and, and our deacons as they help lead our church. Um, Joymakers are going to Baby Sumo, uh, 1st of September is sign-up sheet in the Vestibule, Jeannie, Vestibule, uh, they sign up sheet. PBA Senior Adult Luncheon at Washington is the 10th, uh, so sign up for that. And also that evening on the 10th, we'll have a Chinese auction for our uh, mission team. So uh, just make a note of all those things and, and be involved in, in what's going on here at Tabernacle. It seems like there's always something going on and there's plenty of places uh, to be and to serve and just to, to be a part of what's going on here. Um, if you would, look at the back of your bulletin. Uh, we've got plenty of names. It seems like we add names each and every week, and I failed to uh, add all the ones from Wednesday night, and I just happened to think about that. Um, but Fonda O'Shill, I found out that she was in ICU, I uh, put in ICU yesterday. Uh, I get, couldn't get in touch with Gary this morning, but I'll be in touch with him. So be in prayer for Fonda and Gary. Uh, also, I saw yesterday where Neil Batson, the owner of uh, Bargains, passed away. So be in prayer for that family and, and, the, um, and the employees there at Bargains uh, as they mourn his loss and home going. Uh, if you have a prayer request this morning, if you would, just make it known by uplifting your hand all over the congregation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we just come to you this morning first. We're, we're so thankful that we can be in your house this morning, Father, for the sole purpose of worshiping you. Father, that's what we should do each and every day of our lives. And Father, I just I ask this morning that you just give each person here the strength and the boldness to worship, to live a life that is full of worship. That other people can see that we belong to you. Father, as we worship you this morning, I just pray that all the distractions and all the things we have going on in our lives. Father, that you just take them far, far away so that we can focus our energy this morning on worshiping you and lifting your name high. Father, this morning I just pray that we can be the children that you call us to be. Father, as we worship you, Father, let everything that's said and done just bring honor and glory to your name. 
Father, as we look at this prayer list, and even those that wasn't added, Father, you know the needs. Father, we just ask this morning that, that you just work in the lives of those who are sick, those of, that are struggling with depression, anxiety, addiction, anything they're struggling with, Lord. We put them in your hand and we just ask that you just reach down and be in accordance with your will, Father, that you will just touch them and heal their bodies. Father, all this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Just want to tell you something. As a pastor, I love to get, um, love to get things that talk about Tabernacle Baptist Church and, and our members and how we worship and how we lead. And this is from a um, young lady who came to VBS um, and her grandmother sent this to me. So, Cadence, if you would, push the pulpit mic up. Turn it on up. You can feel that once you walk in, you can just feel everyone's ready to learn about Jesus. And Jesus is just in there saving everybody all at once. It's amazing. I like Tabernacle. That is a testament to, uh, to number one, what Jesus is doing here through each and every one of us. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, those of you that serve during VBS, those of you that are teaching Sunday school, whatever you're teaching and leading, thank you very much. Well, we've already gone old school this morning, so uh, <clears throat> I think about those old all-night singings uh, from the Saturday nights long ago, and uh, we're going to go a little further old school this morning because... Technical difficulties pre prevent us from putting the words up on the screens today. So get a hymnal. Turn to number 426 with me. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. We'll sing all the verses. <laughs> Thank you. 
been here to do to worship you. Just be with each and, each and every one of us. Just lay your healing hand upon the ones that are sick and afflicted. Just touch their bodies and restore them back to their one of health. And be with all the requests of prayer. You know each and every need and each and every one. The ones that raised their hands this morning, just touch their bodies. That answer those requests and say, be your holy and blessed will. Be with this part of the service. Be with the gift and the gift for you to the further to thy kingdom. And direct us, help us, and do your holy will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jamie gave me the permission to change things as uh, as I saw fit sometimes. I love that that Glenda was playing, and I'm pretty sure it's in our hymnal. She's looking it up now. 223, page 223. I think we can really worship with this song this morning. So stand with me again, and let's sing. Alleluia. <clears throat> I will 
Father God, we just come to you today. Father, let us always remember who your Son is in our lives. Father, help us to always praise Him in everything we say, with everything that we do, and in everything that we think. Father, let us praise Him and raise His name above every name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to the book of Jude. Um, we're going to finish up our series this morning, a letter to the endangered church. And church, we are endangered, uh, whether, whether you know it or not. And, and Jude wrote this letter so we could understand what the attacks look like on our church. And as we come to the end of this series, I want to stop for just a moment because we've had a couple of Sundays to where we've uh, done different things, but uh, just want to recap and, and let everybody know where we're at as we end uh, this sermon series. So Jude, in, in the beginning, he clearly established the need for us as followers of Christ to contend earnestly for the faith. Okay? And that means that we need to stand up to this world and the things that are going on in this world, which we haven't done too good, because if we had, guess what? This world wouldn't be as bad off as it is today. We, we are too scared to stand up and say, this is what God says, and this is where I'm going to stand, whether you like it or not. We, we're too afraid to hurt people's feelings nowadays. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stand on the Word of God, and if I, it hurts your feelings, so be it. A couple of weeks ago, uh, one of our church members come to me and said, Preacher, I just want you to know you jumped up and down on my feet today. And I said, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. That was God. Uh, he just used me to deliver the message for you to hear it. Uh, so, but if you want to blame me, blame me. I can take it because God's on my side. Okay? Uh, right from the get-go, he said we've got to contend earnestly for the faith because there's men that are coming into the church who have infiltrated the church, and not only this church, but other churches as well. Uh, he painted a vivid picture of these ungodly men who come into the church with the sole purpose of putting Satan's seed into the church and using it to disrupt what's going on in the church and to change the doctrine, to change God's word and to get people's mind off of what God wants us to hear. He's painted this vivid picture so great that we know what these people look like and we know how they operate. And we talked about that at length the other, a couple of Sundays ago. Listen, 
He talked about the people who left Egypt and were destroyed because of their unbelief. Can you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in Egypt all of your life? That's all you've known is slavery. And then the hand of God moved so mightily through those plagues that Pharaoh said, get out. We don't want you here anymore. And they go running and then they get to the Red Sea and the Red Sea's there and Pharaoh and them change their mind and they're coming after them. And then all of a sudden the sea splits wide open and they walk across on dry ground. Can you imagine that? And then still not have the belief in, G in God to get them to the promised land. Because as soon as it was over, they started whining and crying and everything else. And, and this is apostates, those people who fell away. And then Jude talked about those angels who were in heaven and saw God and experienced God. And they were cast out of heaven. And then he talked about Sodom and Gomorrah in, in uh, the seventh verse of Jude and how wicked that place was and the sexual immorality that went on. Listen, church, we've got to stand up to this world. He talked about those who followed after Cain and Balaam and Korah in Jude uh, verse 11. We also see what lies for those apostates, and that's total destruction and eternal torment in hell. Church, we've got to make sure that when we are talking to people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we're giving it to them straight. We don't need to sugarcoat it because God, Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. The apostles didn't sugarcoat it, so we shouldn't. Listen, if you've got issues with people telling you what the Bible says, that's not our fault. That's issues that you have that you need to get straight. Listen, in our scripture this morning, we're going to see some encouraging guidance from Jude for those followers of Jesus Christ. Remember, I don't like using the word Christians anymore because, you know, anybody, and anybody can say they're a follower of Christ. But listen, when I say I'm a follower of Christ, that means that you need to look at my life and see if it lines up with Christ's life and I'm following Him. Because too many people say I'm a Christian and people just automatically say, oh, he's a Christian, you know. But if we're truly followers of Christ, our lives will look like Christ. Amen? Listen, we're going to see some encouragement here. And, and as followers of Christ, he's given us this encouragement so that we can stand strong in the faith and to be found as, dil as a diligent follower of of Christ who is not ashamed, okay, who is not ashamed to accurately teach the gospel message. Listen, how many of us shared the gospel? I don't want you to hold your hands up because I, I don't want to shame anybody. But how many of us shared the gospel message this week, this past week? If we didn't, why? Are we ashamed? I'm not ashamed. I get up and preach the gospel message. And it's an honor to do that. And it's an honor to share the gospel message. But too many times we get into to situations with certain groups that we hang out with and everything. And we are ashamed to share the gospel message because what they think of us. And that shouldn't be. Okay? So let's look and see what Jude says here. Jude, we're going to start reading in verse 17, and we're going to read through verse 23. Starting in verse 17, Jude says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before you by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How, uh, how they told you that there were, would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust." These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some of you have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Listen, as we begin to look at the scripture this morning, we see, we'll see what we can glean from it. And we need to look at the word that is used twice in these verses so we'll realize who this is directed to, okay? What love do you, what, um, what word do we see that happened twice, that Jude used twice there? Beloved, okay? This word is used throughout Scripture to show that those who are being written to are very dear to the heart of the one who is writing it. Okay? So Jude is writing this, and he's writing it to a church, and he says, Beloved. In other words, he spent time with them. He knows them, okay? And he cares for them. That's why he wrote the letter. He wrote the letter because he wants them to realize what's taking place. And he don't want them to fall away like all the others will do. Can I tell you this morning that you are God's beloved? If you're a follower of Christ, Jude is writing this to you. Okay? We are beloved because we are in Christ. Just like Jude didn't want those people that he was writing this letter to, to be misled. He don't want us to be misled. Okay? So let's look at some of the key uh, verses here. He says, remember those words. What words is he, <clears throat> excuse me, what words is he talking about? He's talking about those words that were spoken by the apostles, those people that like Paul, who set up the churches that he's writing to, he's telling them that those words are very, very important. Why? Because they came from who? Jesus Christ. They came from the Holy Spirit. And the word of Jesus was given to those apostles whom he appointed. Not only did he appoint them, he authorized them to go and preach, and go and teach. Listen, church, you have an obligation to go and preach the gospel message. You have an obligation to Jesus Christ to go and teach the gospel message. But in order to do that, you know what you have to do? You have to know the gospel message. It is vital for us to understand and heed the words of the apostles, just as we do the words of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 13, he says, John says, most, uh, this is Jesus speaking, and, and it's John recording this. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Church, it's important that we go and we teach and we preach the gospel message to reach people for Jesus Christ. We will be received, and as we receive, we're received by them, they will receive Jesus and they will receive God. But more importantly, what did the apostles, what were their other message? Jude's already laid it out, but I want you to listen to the other apostles. In 2 Peter, we, Peter records, he says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the days walking according to their own lusts. See, there's people in the churches now that all they want to do is look out for number one. They want to look out for themselves. They want the new jet. They want the new... Uh, they want the multi-million dollar homes and all this stuff. 
They're walking according to their own lust. And if you look at these people that are doing this and you pay any attention to the message that they're preaching, it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will tell you that. Second Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy, this is what he says. He says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Church, are we in perilous times? I believe we are. And I believe they're going to get worse. But listen, he goes on to say, For men will be lovers of themselves. Sound familiar? Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Yes, youth, I'm looking at all you this morning. Not only you... J.D., quit shaking your head, buddy. Not only you, but... You know, that, that don't just go for you. That goes for the adults here too. He says, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiven, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty. Listen, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. I can't help, it, and, and I laugh, and it's not funny. It's, it's sad, and it's, it hurts my heart. But I was watching a YouTube video the other day where there was, and I forget what denomination it was in, but, but they had the robes on, and they had the, the, I think it's called a stole around their neck and coming down, and it was... Uh, the LGBTQ and this was a pastor and I'm sitting there looking and I couldn't help but think of this verse having a form of godliness but denying its power let me tell you church if I, if I ever was to turn that way there is no way I would stand in the pulpit of God and, and try to do anything because I would be scared to death. I would be scared to death. Paul finishes this and he says, and from such people turn away. Okay, so if we're going this way with these people, and he says turn away from them, we're doing this, we're repenting, right? We're turning back to God. Later on in 2 Timothy, this is what Paul writes again. He says, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, they don't believe what's written in the Word of God. They, they twist it for themselves because they have itching ears. You know what that means, young people? That means that they want a preacher to stand up and preach feel-good messages that, that makes them feel good and so they can walk out feeling as good about themselves as they came in. Let me tell you, I'd much rather have a preacher step on my toes and hurt my feelings and make me cry about my spiritual state than I had somebody to please my ears. He says, they will heap up themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Listen, church, we, we believe anything and everything. Do you know how many people get their beliefs and what they believe is true from TikTok today? See, you laugh, but it's true. It's true. Somebody gets on, a TikTok influencer gets on and says, blah, 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 blah. And a bunch of people believe it. See, we need to know what the truth is. And the truth is in God's Word. And you're not going to get that on TikTok. If you do, it's very few and far between. You're not going to get it on Facebook. The only place you're going to get it is by reading God's Word. By being in a Bible-believing church where a pastor will preach the Word of God and stand on it. 
Listen, Jude is encouraging us. He's guiding us. And he says to remember the words of the apostle. And we're lucky because we've got them written down for us, don't we? We've got them written down. And we can be ready and we can study whenever we want. But church, let me tell you something. For some reason, we don't do that. Let me do a survey. How many of you have got one Bible in the home? Raise your hand. Just one. Oh, well, one or more. How many of you have... And as I go, you can drop your hands. How many has two in your household? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You see what that teaches us? God's Word is readily available to all of us. Now, here's the question. If I was to do the same thing and say, how many of you read the Word of God daily or multiple times daily? And I, I'm not going to do that because God's going to convict you of that Himself. <laughs> but it's readily available to us. Every bit of it from, from Genesis to the end of Exodus, it's all there for us. But many times we're not in God's Word once a day or twice a week or once a month. I heard a story and I think I shared this and if I did, I apologize, but it was a missionary and he was talking to someone in a foreign country and he said, I would love to go to America because America is has the freedom to worship. And the missionary said, I would rather be in your shoes. So the, the missionary is telling the story and he's comparing America to where he was. And, and I, think he, I think it was Indonesia. I don't, I don't know why that keeps coming back to my mind. But see, these people in Indonesia travel three to four hours to get to church. Not only do they travel three to four hours to get to church, they're there an hour and a half before church starts. You know how long church lasts? Not an hour, several hours. They sit on hard wood floors, not in cushy pews. They have no air conditioning. They're packed in, shoulder to shoulder. You know what they have for a Bible? One piece of paper out of the Bible. And they read it. And you know what they do? They read it, and they read it, and they read it, and they commit it to memory. And then you know what they do? They pass it to somebody else, and they'll get another piece of paper out of the Bible. And they'll read it and read it and read it and commit it to memory. And that's how they do. I tell you all the time that we as Americans are at a disadvantage because of all the luxuries we have. We have six Bibles in our homes and we very rarely open one of them. Peter tells us, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with weakness and fear. Church, can I tell you this morning that that defense is, is apologetics, okay? That's giving an answer. It's not a defense. We're not in a debate, but we've got to give an answer to that hope that is inside of us. If somebody came up and said, why are you so happy the world's ending and everything's just going downhill? Why can you be so happy? What would you tell them? Would you be able to tell them about Jesus and the difference He's made in your life and the joy that you have, that that joy 
produces the happiness that you have that doesn't come from external, external circumstance. That's what Peter tells us to do. The next thing that, that Jude talks about, he says, build yourself up in the faith. Now, I don't want you to get that mixed up. We, we come to Jesus and we accept Him and He did the work for our salvation, but we have to build ourselves up, okay? We must be growing as a Christian daily. In other words, we must be getting closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ each and every day. Peter tells us that we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So from Peter's words, we can see that this is not good enough to just have a little knowledge. This building up or growth suggests, listen to this, and I know y'all don't want to hear this, personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. One thing that, and, and even nine years ago as a youth leader, as a youth pastor, and even today I see it. You tell youth to be somewhere at a certain time, and what time do they get there? Five, ten minutes late. But guess what? I come to realize that that, that is a trait that is, or not really a trait, but it's taught to them by their parents. Okay? I've always been told that if, you're, if you have to be somewhere at 10 o'clock, and you get there at 10 o'clock, you're late. Amen? Nobody, that should have been, see, I've, I've been taught that if, if you've got to be somewhere at 10 o'clock, if you want to be on time, you're there at 9.55. Okay? But see, that's part of the personal responsibility. See, we've got a personal responsibility to get up and get in God's Word every day. And let me tell you, I would much rather do my quiet time and my devotion time first thing in the morning because it makes my day go a whole lot better than if I do it at night. If I do it at night, I sleep good. But if I do it in the morning, it just seems like my day goes so smooth. That's not to say there's not ups and downs, but it's a whole lot smoother. But see, we've got a, hat. We've got a personal responsibility to chase after God, okay? In other words, we've got to be in His Word. We've got to be praying. And, and listen, we have so many forms of encouragement. Number one, from God. Our family, our church family. And at the end of the day, it is up to us to grow in our faith with Jesus. Can't help but think. I want you to think about that special somebody in your life. You're looking around awful fast, J.D. <laughs> you need a Band-Aid? You okay? Okay. But think about them. Think about how much when you were dating, what you had to do to impress them. Okay? This might be, this might push my marriage conference a little quicker, but, but think about it. You did all these things to impress that girlfriend, that boyfriend, right? So the next time something rolled around Valentine's Day, the first one you did something pretty good, right? So the next one rolls around, and guess what? Now you got to do outdo what you did last time, right? So you do that. And it keeps going, birthdays, you know, all this stuff. Then you get married, and what happens? Boop. Same thing. Scott said same thing. Save money. Oh. Annette goes, bloop. Scott says, it's saving money. But 
That's the way it is, isn't it? That's the way, I think that's the way we look at our relationship with Jesus Christ. Once we, once we have that salvation, it goes, Loop. but we've got to chase daily after him and build ourselves in the faith and know his word and apply his word to our lives. Jude says, pray in the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a, weird, a weird little phrase there. But what he's talking about here is as we're reading and studying God's Word, it's vital for us to pray. And it's a perfect complement to God's Word to pray. But when we're reading God's Word, we're, we're learning His Word, and we're learning His will for our lives. So when we pray in the Holy Spirit, what that means is that we're aligning our will with the Holy Spirit's will. And when we do that, we're, we're praying in the Holy Spirit. If you look at Ephesians 6.18, we see that Paul is telling us to do this. He says, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Okay, This focuses us as followers of Christ to align to God's Word and to God's will. Okay, Hopefully that makes sense. He says, stay in the love of God, in verse 21. Again, this is personal responsibility. We have a part to play here, and we have to stay aligned with God's will to stay in His love. Jesus taught that the greatest commandment was to what? Love the Lord God with what? All your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with Everything that you are, right? With all your strength. And that's daily seeking Him. See, we've got to do that to stay in the love of God. Why is it important for us to stay in the love of God? Because if we're out and people make us mad, uh, Devin, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. You on the road and Josh. Y'all on the road a lot. What happens on the road when we're driving down the interstate? We get upset, don't we? We get mad. We want to blow the horn. We want to do things with our hands that we ought not do, right? We say things that we ought not do, right? But the love of God, if it's in us, what does that do? That curbs that, don't it? It curbs that. And we respond a whole lot differently. If that person walks up at the grocery store, you walk up behind a, a young mother at the grocery store with two or three kids and she's got $25 worth of groceries and she don't have any money, the love of God's going to tell you to do what? Pay for it. Right? That's what the love of God does. It produces a love in each and every one of us that shows Jesus Christ. Be compassionate with fear. It's what Jude says. You know what compassion is? Love in action. See, we think we can have compassion for somebody, but unless it moves us to action, it's worth nothing. Compassion is a love that will not let you be still but pulls at your heartstrings. How many of you seen a situation or heard about a situation and, and you say, well, I'm just going to let it go. But it keeps coming back to your mind. Might even produce tears. And before long, you, you, you know you're right in the middle of the situation helping out. That's what compassion is. Church, we must be fearful and very cautious that our compassion does not allow us to get caught up in the same error of the ungodly. Do you hear me? See, our compassion, our love for somebody can, can get us there in the middle of a situation, and while we're trying to help in the middle of this situation, we're somewhere that we shouldn't be alone, right? 
Because if we, somebody else is there with us, they can say, wake up. But if we're there by ourselves, we've got to be careful that we don't get caught up in what else is going on and, and be some of those ungodly people that Jude has been talking about. As we end this series, we need to realize that as we remember the words of the apostles and we apply them to our lives and build ourselves up in the faith, we've got to realize that first of all, we must have the correct foundation. Because if you don't pour a foundation for a house, Deep enough, what happens? It sinks and all this stuff and it messes the house up. But if we build our house on the word of Jesus Christ, we'll have that firm foundation that is built on that gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we can stand firm, we can stand on it and never waver. We can stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ knowing, listen to me this morning, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, right? He never did anything wrong. He was tempted. He never did anything wrong. That he was tried, that he was beaten, hung on an old rugged cross, spilt his blood for you and for me and died on that old rugged cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, he rose. And now he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He's making intercession for you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ is sitting there saying, Father, give him just a little more time. Father, give her just a little more time. Let somebody else tell her or him about me and what I did for him. He's interceding because he realizes what happens to those who do not truly believe and follow in him. Church, we must pray in the Spirit. And keep ourselves in the love of God and stay compassionate. This morning as we have our invitation, it's God's invitation. My, my prayer this morning is that, um, that God won't let you sit still or stand still. God, that God just gets your feet moving. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that, that He will just not leave you alone. That He won't give you a minute's sleep. If you, if you, until you come to him. That's going to be my prayer. Father God, this is your invitation. We're thankful for your word and how your word instructs, how your word teaches, how your word convicts. And Father, this morning, it's my prayer that if somebody's here that doesn't know you, as their, as, doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, Father, that today will be the day. Father, don't give them rest until they realize that they need to follow your son to have a relationship with you. Father, whatever you're calling us to do, Father, I just pray that you'll give us the boldness to step out and to make it known to this congregation so we can celebrate what you're calling us to. Father, all this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Would you stand and sing number 294 in the hymn book?